Welcome to Writer's Life, an ongoing conversation with writers, authors, and folks in the publishing industry. I'm your host, Marvel Harrison, Publishing Director, Members Press of Western New Mexico University. It's a pleasure to share a conversation today with Megan Dom, an award-winning author, writer of five books, at least, maybe more, a columnist for The New Yorker, The New York Times Magazine, Atlantic, Vogue, GQ, Harper's, you kind of name it, she's been there. And most exciting to me is she now hosts a very engaging podcast, The Unspeakable. Be sure and check it out and we'll hear more in our discussion today. Welcome to Writer's Life, Megan. Hi, Marvel. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. You know, this conversation is, I'd love to hear a little bit about how you got started in the world of writing, journalism, wherever you want to take it. I'm really interested in learning more about your your history and your process. Yeah, well, I'll have to roll back the clock a couple of decades to talk about how I got started. So I um, I started publishing in the early to mid 1990s, and that was really the heyday of narrative journalism, magazines were publishing incredibly interesting um, first person narrative nonfiction, as well as reported pieces. I was very much in the school of Joan Didion and Tom Wolfe and the kind of new journalists of the 70s, the generation that had preceded me. So I started writing um, kind of personal essays that looked at the world sort of through the lens of my own experience as a very young person at that time, right? So, you know, when you're in your 20s, you think that nobody has ever experienced the things that you're experiencing and that you have a completely uh, unique worldview. So um, I was I was lucky and I was able to start publishing um, pretty prominently fairly early on. And I was a freelance writer. I've always been freelance. I've written for all the magazines that you named, yes, but I have not been on staff at those places. I've always been self-supporting. Okay, and, um, so a uh, contributor <laughs> rather than a columnist. Yeah, that's okay. Well, okay. I was a columnist at the Los Angeles Times for 11 years, so I was an opinion columnist there. Um, but yeah, I've just, I've always kind of just skated along between assignments and writing books and teaching and all the different things and it's um it's it's a it's a life of ideas uh maybe more so than a life of uh <laughs> a lot of cash let's just put it that way <laughs> yes um i think about writers authors so often it's about being in the process and not the product and you know good for you for hanging in there for several <laughs> decades of of managing to make that work in your life somehow. Yeah, I mean, I guess to me, I always say, I say this to students, you know, what do you want to get out of this? Because I think there are lots of ways to approach any creative endeavor, especially writing. You know, you can do it because you love the process, because you just love writing. I certainly have students that they say, I don't care about being published or even anybody reading this. I just love to write. And that makes me so happy when I hear that, um, because so many of us get caught up in, am I going to get this published? Is it going to be a bestseller? Is, some, is so-and-so doing better than me? What kind of reviews am I going to get? All that kind of stuff. Um, and so I guess for me over the years, some books have done well and some have done not so well and and you really never know how it's going to turn out but i love the sort of relationship with the reader i love thinking on the page and then having somebody read it and then feeling like i have some kind of dialogue with them either if it's through teaching or lecturing or going and meeting with people and that's very much what the podcast has become so i see it as just kind of having a Sort of an intellectual relationship with with the world if that doesn't sound too grandiose <laughs> i think it's an intellectual conversation with whomever is going to participate yeah and i i think it's wonderful um in your past when you're teaching do you have any particular highlights or sort of nuggets that you want to leave with students yeah you know when i teach memoir one of the things that i really emphasize is that you wanna be talking to your reader. I think one of the things that happens is that people take writing workshops 
and they'll take a fiction workshop, for example, or even nonfiction, and they're told to show, show, don't tell. It's always show, put it in scene, make a scene, have dialogue. And we certainly need some of that. But for me, the real secret of memoir writing, for example, is that you're telling your story. You're inviting your reader in. You're saying, let me tell you the story of what happened. You're not going to believe this. And here it is. And so you want to have the sense that you are talking to your reader, that you've like sort of sat down across from the table with your reader and leaned in and you're you're confiding something. And so I think that tends to really open up people's perspectives when they get permission to tell as well as show and even maybe tell a little more than show. And I think that they are actually liberated by that. Well, as a psychologist, that's really meaningful to me because I think every single person has their unique, beautiful history. It's different than their siblings. It's different than their neighbors. It's different than the people that they've spent their lives with their perspective and how they have seen and experienced the world is who they are. So I, I often say um, we're all A students in history. We sometimes forget how we remember. We want the video image going around, but you know, it's in our feelings and in our experiences and how we live our lives. So right. I am so um, please that there's somebody out there supporting that process of of telling. Yeah, well, I'm not the only one, but people should. I just want I want to give people permission. You know, I think that's what a lot of a lot of creative people need is just permission to to tell their story and not feel like they have to justify their existence. Or a lot of people say, well, nobody cares about my story. Or, or they say, you know, this is such a strange story that it's not worth telling because nobody will relate. And it's like, oh, no, 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 it's the other way around. The more specific you are, even if it's taking you in very strange places, people will connect to that and find, draw from their own experience from reading it. That's great. How did, how did you transition into, you started your podcast two years ago, is that right? Yeah, during the pandemic when everybody started a podcast. It was okay, the, well, the that's true. Day in the world. <laughs> well, tell me about that process of starting that. And I mean, it's such a great title, but it, it absolutely um, doesn't fall short of what, what the title brings. Oh, good. Well, it is the title of a book of mine. So I did publish a book called The Unspeakable mm -hmm. um, in 2014. Um, and so the podcast is not directly related to the book, but I had always wanted to do a podcast. I love interviewing people. I always loved radio. I love talking. I love listening. Um, and so I had been kind of trying to figure out how to do it for several years. And then the pandemic came along and, you know, everybody had a little extra time. And I really wanted to find a way to have present conversations that were asking sensitive questions, but not in a, not in a reactionary way, not in a gratuitously provocative way. It's all about nuance, right? So that the, uh, that's my, my merch line is actually nuanced AF, right? That's the, uh, that's the motto of the show. But, you know, I, I'm one of these people that you know, over the last several years have gotten really um, invested in trying to prevent tribalism and, and the way that the new culture wars have played out and the way it's become so difficult, if not impossible, to have really necessary conversations because certain subjects have been deemed taboo or unspeakable. And unfortunately, we're not gonna make progress as a society if we are not able to talk about certain things and, you know, accept certain facts and have agreed upon sense of reality. And, you know, these subjects that they include things like, like gender and gun control and class and now COVID policy, education, all of these kinds of things, you know, we used to be able to talk about them in good faith and disagree in good faith. And somewhere along the line, um, it just became verboten to do so. So I want to have conversations that were like neither super far on the right or super far on the left. I wanted them to be um, definitely not provocative, but surprising. But I also didn't want them to be trollish. So my job is to sort of bring in people 
to talk about things in a way that we can show, oh yeah, it actually is possible to talk about what's going on with gender ideology. It is possible to talk about what's happened, why we're seeing such an increase in, in kids announcing gender identities without denouncing trans people, without doing anything that is like pandering to the left or pandering to the right, but actually having a straightforward conversation. And I wanna model that way of talking about things. And hopefully that's that's what we've been doing. I think you have. And I think that there's just baseline, a practical approach you take. And it's probably embedded in kindness without that being the theme. Mm. It's like, you know, there's thoughtfulness. You do it, you do it in such a care filled way without, you know, not treading on difficult subjects. And yeah, yeah. I think one of the things that's happened is that it's it's become so difficult to talk about these things and the 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 repercussions for saying the wrong thing are so high that it's almost like the smart people are smart enough to keep their mouths shut. And so I always say if if the smart, thoughtful people don't speak up, the stupid, thoughtless people are happy to do the job. And that's why we have to just proceed and have conversations that that are going to be that are going to be difficult. Um, and so that's, you know, that's what we're trying to do. So I'm, I'm glad you appreciate it. Not everybody <laughs> does, you know, I get some feedback. <laughs> I'm sure you do. And good for you having a, 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 a backbone to just take the, you know, I mean, here you are, I think it's way more important to have a backbone than a wishbone. And you're doing the backbone, you know, oh, you're just you, you know, you're just, you're just like, okay, we're going to have this conversation and it's not going to be a hundred percent. Um, I don't even know what the word is I want to use, you know, well, you're not going to win over everybody. I mean, by no. definition, I always, there's another thing that I say to my writing students, you know, nobody will love you unless somebody hates you. <laughs> the worst thing you can do is try to please everybody, to try to equivocate, to try to clear your throat so at such length before you say anything um, substantive that you've lost before you've started. So it's I, I just think it's really important to to um, to know that you can you can say things. People being mad at you doesn't kill you. It's really not the end of the world. They're just mad at you and frankly they're not thinking about you that much people think about themselves most of the time <laughs> that that is such a an important piece to know and that part about just like anger is what probably fuels the most positive forward movement in our lives you know mm. somebody has to get a little bit ranked up to actually make some decisions and and uh you know go forward so yeah yeah how do how do you come up with your I mean, you you obviously covered a lot of the most obvious topics, you know, the gun violence, gender, you, you know, you've touched in some of yours on the Roe versus Wade, which of course right. is, you know, so prominent. How did, where, are you out walking and this just pops into your head about, oh, I should talk to? Yeah. Uh, oh, there's so many ideas. I really just, I think, okay, what are people talking about? that I don't think they're talking about in quite the right way. Like, what, what do I want to hear about, but I'm frustrated with the, with the way the conversation has gone so far. Like, one of the interviews that I'm the proudest of is, was a conversation about this concept of the incel. I don't know if you know what that is. That stands for involuntary celibate. And that is this sort of oh. subculture of young men that are very angry at women and they they are organized online. There's a lot of Reddit communities and they say a lot of them, not all, but many of them say very vile misogynist things. And their premise is that, you know, they can't get a girlfriend so that all women are terrible. And they've been associated with a lot of mass shootings and violent attacks um, in a way that I think is, is misrepresented. And I actually think that there's something about this incel phenomenon that has to do with, um, with the results and the fruits of feminism and the dating and the mating economy and the way women have achieved, you know, so much in the last 50 years and men for various reasons are being left behind. I think this little incel phenomenon, which is always reduced to this, these are a bunch of misogynist mass shooters is about so much more. And it's so rich to me. So I brought on a woman named Nama Cates who has a, a podcast called Incel and she interviews these guys and she studies these guys and she's 
similarly interested. And so that's an example of somebody that, you know, most people have never heard of her. They've never thought about this topic. They just, it would never occur to them to sort of go any deeper into this. And yet I had her on and we had a, a great conversation. So that's what excites me the most when I kind of these little, little weird niches and, and go deep. That is so good. I wasn't familiar with the term incel. I, I, I've, you know, yeah, well, now you'll see it everywhere when now that you're aware of it. Yes. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm sure I just hadn't heard it in those terms, but you know, if there were a, a topic that is gnawing at you now, what might it be? Mm, well, I am interested, I don't know if it's gnawing at me, but I've been wanting to talk about um, the voluntary human extinction movement. I don't know if you know what that is. Yeah, very so interesting. That is a concept that um, the world would be a better place without humans. It's an environmental kind of climate concept, but it's actually been, it's, it's, it has a very long history. And so these are people who believe that humans should just sort of over the generations, just slowly stop reproducing and go extinct and that the planet would be better off if there were other animals and species, but not humans. And since I've done a lot of work around choosing not to have children, um, for all kinds of reasons. And that's another conversation. I feel like you have to be very honest um, and not gimmicky and not glib and hollow about it. I want to talk really honestly about that because it's a choice that I've made, but I take it really seriously. I want to talk about what it would mean if we all went extinct. I'm not uh, in favor of this, but I also think it's like something that is fascinating to think about. And so I'm trying to find... Um, somebody who can speak to this in a very smart uh, way. So there you go. That sounds most intriguing. I wish I had a suggestion of a person. I don't. Yes, they've all, exactly. <laughs> they've all gone extinct. I, there is a, there is actually, I mean, the voluntary human extinction movement is a, is an organization. I think they have like a website. So we, you know, we don't necessarily need to link to it uh, here, but we'll um, maybe I'll no, track but... it down soon. Yeah, well, good for you. And you are starting, you've done a retreat, you're starting to do some retreats. Tell me about that part of your next step. I'm really excited about this. So I'm creating something called the Unspeakeasy, which is a community for critical thinking women. So sometimes we call this the heterodox space, just people who are open to um, a wide range of ideas, free thinking. So how I got this idea is that I was teaching memoir and workshops, writing workshops, and I've been doing them for years. And increasingly over the last few years, I've had people coming into the class, women mostly, even though the classes are open to men and women. I've had women come in and they just want to talk about ideas. They've been listening to the podcast. They're increasingly frustrated with groupthink in their communities among their peers, not being able to speak their minds, getting, you know, knowing that they are liberals or on the left, but getting excommunicated by their lefty friends, all this kind of stuff. They want to talk about it. And they they didn't even want to write as much. Like I was like, why are we bothering writing when you guys just want to like have a discussion? And I thought more and more about this. And there are a lot of podcasters in this space, in this free think space. There are communities around those podcasts. There are journalists, but they tend to be very male dominated. Um, not every, you know, there are definitely exceptions. There are women, but it's a lot of men. A lot of the audiences, um, at least the audiences that form the communities around these kind of figures, tend to be very male dominated. I know because I've joined a couple of them, and there's like hardly any women. So I thought, gosh, there's something going on. I have so many women writing to me, coming to the classes, telling me how frustrated they are, how sad they are to have lost their friends over some of these issues, um, how they're afraid to open their mouths because they don't want to hurt people's feelings even. And so I thought we need to find each other because we're really not alone. People talk about feeling so alone and like they're going crazy, but, but we're all here, you know? And I think it's important for women to be in a space to talk about these things together because I think that women are more sensitive to the social penalties that come from speaking out. I'm not gonna say that we get punished more for them because I think men see a lot of repercussions, but women in general tend to care more. They care more if their friend is mad at them. 
They, they don't want to rock the boat at their kid's school. They don't want to be on the wrong side of the group in the carpool line, for instance, at their book club. They've been kicked out of their Facebook group, this kind of thing. So I'm building an online community that's going to have groups. We're going to have virtual events, um, different topics, different focuses. Um, and we're also going to have these retreats. And so I'm thinking of them as sort of like a... Uh, ideas vacations or uh, women's shelter for the politically homeless. I know that's that's a, not a very politically correct way to put it, but um, yeah, we're gonna have small groups and we're gonna go places and just have a series of discussions over three or four days and have some guest speakers and I'll facilitate these discussions and um, I'm super excited. It's I never thought I would become like a cruise director uh, <laughs> in, in my career, but I seem to have, uh, I need to get a little degree in hotel management as I try to figure this out, but it's exciting. <laughs> it is. Uh, I re remember in the early 80s working for the public health department in New Mexico, and we set up a women's wellness conference. And oh. it was about like-minded women who went up to Ghost Ranch, you know, the home of George O'Keefe. Yes. And every year we would have four days of conversation. And women are about connection. Yeah. You know? And it's not that we necessarily do it better, but we're more conscious and more heartfelt yeah. and, you know, exposed by it. As you said, you know, we're, we're hurt more when it, it. Yeah. Yeah. It, and we're concerned about other people's feelings. Yeah. yeah. So uh, good, good for you doing that. Actually, one of our, our guest speakers and a speaker could only come if they stayed the entire time was Sarah. And oh, how do you say her last name? Who was the attorney for Roe versus Wade? Um, oh Wedding, Wedding, Weddington. I can't remember. But anyway, okay. she was, you know, just remarkable. She'd only wow. been she had only done her five years before she could even go to the Supreme Court. She barely made it by a month or two that she could actually speak. And so having women, yeah, good for you. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, people can go to the unspeakeasy.com. We have a landing page of hundreds and hundreds of people on the mailing list already. And we haven't even launched yet officially. So um, yeah, I think it's going to be something really new and, and exciting for everybody. So, well, I think it's terrific. And well, I just want to thank you very you much. Join us. You should come. You should, uh, I, you should do a retreat. I, I think I will. I have it. I already was looking at the next ones. I think they're in Vermont and New York, upstate New York. Is that right? Yeah. Well, I mean, it's fall, it's, it's autumn. So I thought, you know, you, you want to be in the, in the Northeast. So yeah, we're having a one in um, Bennington, Vermont at the end of September and one in um, just outside of New York city in, in October, but they're very small. So I meet with everybody ahead of time and I want to match. I want to find the right fit so I'm going to make sure that everybody brings something different to the table because it's not just me talking. Everyone's going to sort of facilitate a discussion or bring her own set of um, expertise or just in insights. So it's very much a, a group, a group effort. And these will be ongoing and I'm sure oh. they'll be all in, in all parts of our our um world. our world hopefully you should see the the venue suggestions like <laughs> all over people want these things australia i i have no, <laughs> no doubt and you bring a real gift and that ability to have difficult conversations wow. i just honor you for that and i thank you and i thank you for being a part of this program today you know it's been a joy to speak with you um, and Megan, thanks also to everyone who has joined us. And in closing, I'm Marvel Harrison, and from all of us at Mimbris Press, may your day be sparked with curiosity and wonder. See you again on the next Writer's Life.